And with the leadership of our chief public health officer, we have moved forward with some of the most aggressive policies in the country. We've closed our borders before almost everyone else. We mandated isolation near hospitals to protect our remote communities. We've tested those without travel, connections to travel. And today we're making more steps to protect our families, our friends and our communities. Dr. Kendola has now ordered all indoor gatherings across the territory to be canceled effective tomorrow. Gatherings are things like house parties, funerals, church mass, or spiritual congregations, feasts. Any event, any event that brings people together who do not already live together. She has also limited outdoor gatherings to less than 10 people and mandated social distancing for any of the for any of these which may occur. While we provided this advice weeks ago, we are now confident and it is necessary to put legal weight behind these measures to respond to this unprecedented threat. Dr. Condola has also ordered that certain types of businesses must close for the time being. This is once again a matter of putting legal force behind what our business community was already implementing as a recommendation. And Dr. Condola has also ordered strict screening, tracking, and protection measures at mining and oil and gas sites in the Northwest Territories effective today. These orders will be enforced by our Compliance Enforcement Task Force, which we announced on Wednesday. We are better equipped than ever to respond and investigate if our orders are not followed and public health is put at risk. I'm confident in Dr. Kendola and her approach to protect the Northwest Territories. <clears throat> it has served us well thus far, but we must not get complacent. We are, we are in it for months, not weeks. And if we aren't on, all on the same team, we could be a lot longer. So we know that if you aren't canceling parties, if you're still having friends over, if you're not washing your hands, keeping six feet between each other, avoiding each other as much as you can and self-isolating if you feel sick at all then you're not doing your part and if you don't respond to education warnings we're coming for you thank you i'll pass it over to minister knuckleby thank you minister tom first of all i want to recognize what everybody already knows that all northwest territories businesses are making difficult decisions as they implement the measures being asked of them to limit the spread of COVID-19 across our territory. The government of the Northwest Territories recognizes this. We acknowledge that this is happening at a cost to business owners and entrepreneurs in the North. And we will continue to seek out, identify and facilitate ways to support your efforts and address these challenges. Today, Dr. Candola is implementing new orders around mining and oil and gas. Companies in these sectors have worked closely with our public health officials to implement many of the recommended measures already, despite no obligation to do so. This order captures many of the precautions and safety protocols that mineral and petroleum companies have already put in place through their own efforts, and by following the guidance of public health officials from across the country. I want to thank our resource companies, for, in particular, for working with us and taking extraordinary measures to protect their workforce and for their commitment to operate safely for as long as they can. Through the COVID-19 pandemic, our resource companies have proven themselves to be strong corporate citizens and protocols have been put in place to ensure the health and safety of our residents. For instance, all transient employees entering the Northwest Territories are being screened with temperature testing, questionnaires and pre-departure screening calls. If an employee or contractor shows signs of illness or has a high exposure risk, they are told to remain at home. Charter aircraft flights have been introduced as much as possible to separate the travel of northern and southern workers and to reduce or eliminate interactions with commercial airline travelers. Charter flights, charter flight protocols now include enhanced cleaning of aircraft, changes to or elimination of food and beverage services and phys physical distancing measures. On sites, companies have been following enhanced hygiene and cleaning awareness and practices for several weeks now. 
Social distancing measures have been incorporated for safety meetings, transportation, all workspaces, and in the dining halls and accommodations. As much as possible, southern workers are being segregated from northern workers. All operators have also established dedicated quarantine facilities with and procedures. Companies will quarantine and treat any worker with COVID-19 symptoms. Medical personnel are on site to deal with situations that occur and there will be no hesitation in using medevac services should advanced medical care be deemed necessary. Our resource companies have worked hard to inform their immediate staff of the precautions that are being taken. They are also, have also taken time to inform their communities and Indigenous IBA partners as regularly, as well as to reach out and see what the community needs are and to help in any way that they can during these tough times. Similarly, the Premier and I have also taken steps to inform and advise our territory's leaders of the extraordinary steps and initiatives being taken at these sites. The situation is evolving quickly across Canada, which is why these additional measures announced today are needed. By implementing these orders, we continue to ensure the right precautions are in place to protect Northwest Territories residents from the risks of having Southern transient workforce entering the territory. It is our goal to reduce the risks that exist from COVID-19. We recognize that this is and will be as much of an economic crisis as it is a health one. But we are assured that the precautions that are being taken mean our remote work sites are as safe as they can be. With the restrictions and considerations that have been put in place, our government is supportive of continued operations at work sites that have cho chosen to follow this path. I would also like to recognize the importance of the resource sector to the Northwest Territories now and in the future. This includes not just our mining industry, but also our advanced project and exploration companies. I want to reassure businesses and residents of, that the government of the Northwest Territories understands the challenges you are faced with and takes this situation very seriously. Safety is our number one priority. But next to that is ensuring that our economy remains healthy and people feel secure. I would now like to turn it over to Dr. Candola to explain the details of the orders being addressed today. Thank you. Thank you, Minister Nockleby. Let's talk for a moment about what these orders actually mean and how we're going to implement them. The most important thing we can all do to flatten the COVID-19 curve is to practice physical distancing. This is something that Dr. Theresa Tam, Chief Public Health Officer for Canada, has recommended for all Canadians. Our order on gatherings will allow private gatherings outside of no more than 10 people, provided physical distancing of six feet apart can occur. This order does restrict indoor private gatherings to only people in your immediate household that is, those who you live with. Public gatherings are prohibited both indoors and outdoors. And if you are on the land, a tent or cabin is the same as your house. No visitors from outside your household. However, you can go out on the land with others. Just keep six feet apart like you would at a grocery store or the public or in public. These limitations are necessary because anytime you increase number of people you are in contact with, the virus can pass to others. We all need to keep our social circles small to contain the spread. I do recognize this is going to be a huge adjustment for Northwest Territories residents. We are very social. We enjoy having our friends over for dinner and we enjoy our parties. And I realize it can put a strain on relationships where it may be difficult to stay physically apart for so long. It is not lost on me that this will impact mental health. So what I encourage everyone to do is get creative. We've seen churches offering online sermons, especially this most important holiday, which is Easter. We're seeing people using Zoom or Google Hangouts to have long chats with their friends. We're seeing groups starting up on Facebook where people are having virtual kitchen parties to keep connected and have some laughs. And with the warmer weather and longer days, 
go outdoors. This is a healthy way to decrease mental stress. But if you do need help, our health authorities are still delivering mental health services. So get in touch and get help. This order also mandates the closing of several kinds of businesses. But proper social distancing is not possible because of the way they operate. These businesses are tourism operators, bottle depots, gyms and fitness centers, museums and art galleries, bars and nightclubs, theaters and movie theaters, dining portions of restaurants, personal service establishments. There are also exceptions to this order. This order excludes workers and workplaces if you are an essential service or a sector supporting essential services like healthcare workers, some government services, or daycares and day homes. It excludes facilities offering health and social services support to our at-risk communities like sobering centers and shelters. It excludes retail, retailers like grocery stores, gas stations, banks, and pharmacies. These are considered to be essential to the continued function of our territory. It does exclude liquor stores because in the short term, withdrawal and non-consumable alcohol consumption amongst those experiencing addiction endangers public health more than keeping them open will. Businesses not already mandated to close who are able to modify operations to ensure proper social distancing may also stay open. We reserve the right to revisit this, but I will say I have been impressed with the ingenuity of our business community's response to COVID-19. Touchless methods of delivery, online video, and other ingenious methods have been great. Our second order relates to remote work camps. This order largely strengthens the good practices we already recommended weeks ago, and our work sites have generally complied with this already. We are putting legal force behind them now, as we understand the anxieties of our residents and now have the enforcement capacity to address them. These measures include things like mandating health screenings before each shift and before coming to site, immediate self-isolation on site if showing symptoms, not allowing those who have symptoms to be on the work site, social distancing measures on and off rotation, on-site precautions such as hand cleaning before entering the cafeteria, social distancing of dining tables, pre-wrapped food, removal of salad bars, and unfortunately ice cream machines, pre-dished meals, single-use utensils, single-use condiment, <laughs> increased cleaning of our door handles in high traffic areas such as the bathroom and meeting areas, and a number of other measures. We have also made it mandatory to keep worksite risk assessments on every employee, allow for them to be inspected by WSCC when required. I would like to thank everyone who has followed our recommendations over the past month. I encourage everyone to do all that you can to flatten the COVID-19 curve. And I would like to commit to Northwest Territories residents that we will be working around the clock to make sure these orders work and our communities are protected. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Minister Tom, Minister Knockleby, and Dr. Candola. I'm going to open it, the floor to questions from media who have called in. I'd like to remind viewers at home, I know we've got a lot of you watching on the Cabinet Communications Facebook page. Um, if you have any questions related to the information being uh, delivered today, please do not hesitate to put it there. We'll do our best to try and get those answered for you today. Um, so I'm going to start today um, with Mo, Mo from Moose FM if you've got some questions. I think your mic is still muted, Mo. Okay, we'll give him a minute to figure out the mic situation, and I'm going to turn it over to Ollie at Cabin Radio. 
Yeah, thank you, Crystal, and hello, everybody. A uh, question for the Chief Public Health Officer. Just spell out for us, would you, if you can, regarding indoor gatherings. Essentially now, unless you're in your house with members of your own family who live there, anything other than that is illegal at this point. Is that my understanding? Or from tomorrow? Correct. Effective as of noon tomorrow. Okay. Now, uh, I, I realize that... Um, we have a relatively new enforcement team in place as well. What are your hopes for enforcement of this on the weekend? It's a holiday weekend. People are only going to be learning about this now. Chances are many people in the Territory won't learn about this for many hours and days to come because not everybody, of course, has the internet. So there has to be a public education campaign. What's your approach going to be for this weekend? So for this weekend, we have an enforcement team right now. They're being oriented. We do have a protect NWT email and we have a toll free line. We would be providing warnings and education has, um, if there's any complaints that are sent on that line. What we, we've had a, over 180 complaints and a common theme in some of the complaints have been parties happening at people's houses where alcohol was involved, where there's multiple people. And this particular order would be able to allow us to enforce uh, those type of activities. Typically, when it comes to the public, if they're, we look at the risk and we look at um, providing education. So over the weekend, initially we will be communicating to the public if we do get complaints coming in related to mass gatherings in homes. Thank you. I'm going to jump actually right away to a question we have from viewers. So a number of viewers are asking us to clarify, what does that look like when we say 10 gathering outside? Can you explain that a little more in detail? So on March 22nd, we had a um, public health advisory recommending cancellation of all gatherings, all mass gatherings. But what we do realize is that with longer days, with the weather warming up, that it is a healthy activity to go outside. And the risk outside is pretty minimal. People maintain social distancing. So instead of canceling all mass gatherings, we allow the provision of including public gatherings outside. So that means if you have a friend and you both want to walk your dogs together, you can meet, um, keep six feet apart, and um, go for walks together. If you have um, a relationship with someone else, another household, you're allowed to meet outdoors um, up to 10 people. It allows us to take advantage of the outdoors, take advantage of the summer, and still socially connect. Okay, thank you. I'm going to see if Mo uh, from Moose FM has figured out the mic situation. I'd love to get him to ask a question. <clears throat> no? Okay. <laughs> uh, we'll turn it over to Simon, Northern News Services. Yeah, I'm just curious. Uh, there was some discussion with the city of Yellowknife um, earlier this week about uh, concerns over allowing companies in. <laughs> sort of like yeah. Sorry, remove the ice. Uh, and I'm just wondering if... Uh, if the chief public officer so I, I think I'll have some questions for general okay sorry okay no Simon go ahead we'll go back to Mo in a sec oh okay um, just I think there was mention there about uh, companies coming into the territory and um, the city of Yellowknife had mentioned some difficulties earlier this week about uh, I guess specifically ice an ice company coming in and so on I'm just what what uh, complications might this rise for municipalities uh, bringing companies in like like Simcoe, for example, or, or other uh, companies. Okay, so this is about bringing companies in from other jurisdictions? Yeah. Minister. Okay, I can talk about, on March 21st, I had a general public health order that um, we had border restrictions uh, for people trying to get into the Northwest Territories who are not Northwest Territories residents, but we did have exemptions for People who are essential workers um, provide essential services. We had a number of exemptions. And so people who are trying to support the critical infrastructure, 
by trying to maintain the functioning of our cities, of our towns and other communities who are providing food and other critical services that they're exempt from this order. What we are requiring is that um, they conduct, so the employer, whoever's bringing them in, conduct a workplace risk assessment. This is available on the website for WSCC. So for instance, um, they're bringing in someone to provide a critical service. They need to A, provide them a letter to say that they're exempt. So when they're at the border, the uh, border security know that they have exemption status and they're able to cross. Prior to that crossing, they should be uh, consulting the WSCC website, looking at a worksite risk, um, risk assessment and ensuring how can that company provide their services in a way that protects the public and protects other workers. And what, if they're not a closed campsite, what we're requiring that when they're off shift that they have to self-isolate like everyone else for the full 14 days. Okay, I'm gonna give Minister Knockleby an opportunity to add to that as well. <clears throat> Um, thank you. Uh, I think Dr. Candle did a really great job actually of summarizing that. I would just speak a little bit further that some of the exemptions would be along um, transportation companies, things like that, where the, the worker would not be uh, required to isolate or to even stay in the territory. They'll come, they'll do their work and they'll leave. Um, I would acknowledge that we probably have a little bit of a case by case situation depending upon um, what work is being done and where they need to do it. And obviously if we were looking at someone going into a small community, that needs to do work there, we would be um, you know, looking at that as a specific case and determining at that time if there were additional measures that needed to be put into place. I think one thing to keep in mind is that uh, WSCC protocols uh, still apply to every single work site that we have in the Northwest Territories, and therefore COVID has now become another risk factor in their assessment process. So if somebody is violating something from a COVID safety standpoint in a work site, they would still be subject to work, work site safety law. So um, I think that's going a long way to help protect workers. But again, I think it would be fairly case by case if there were specific instances where an essential service or needed to be provided and uh, you know, we didn't have the opportunity to have the isolations. Thank you. Simon, did you have a follow-up question? Yeah, I did. Um, so just to be 100% clear again then, so as effective tomorrow at noon then, people will be able to uh, reach anyone sort of on the public line um, for assistance if they're, if they're sort of public gatherings and so on? Is that, is that the idea? Because in the past, I think there's been some complaints where people haven't been able to reach uh, officials during the weekends and so on. Hi, Simon. When you uh, go to the website, um, the HSS website, and click on coronavirus, there, on, there, there's a toll-free line that we've used for the self-isolation plans, and we have the protect NWT at gov.nt.ca email. This toll-free line and the email was established on March 21st for compliance with the initial public health order on um, travel restrictions. It's the same line that you'll be using or the public will be using to, um, to submit their complaints around mass gatherings. Why we had to put the mass gatherings under order is it allows enforceability. We've had, on March 22nd, we had a public health advisory put out on mass gatherings. So people have been submitting those complaints and they're being investigated. By putting it to order, we can now, um, it's ticketable, it's enforceable, and we haven't changed the toll-free line, and we haven't changed the email to access it. We just have more people to be able to implement the order. Thank you. All right, we're going to head over to Mo at Moose FM one more time. I see him up there. Okay, we're going to give Danielle then at CBC an opportunity. Hi there, thanks so much for meeting with us today. Um, first question is just can we could we just lay out again, I'm, I'm sure it may be just the same as the public health orders, but what exactly enforcement looks like, what um, consequences there are for people having these gatherings? Is it varying between, you know, if, if someone is not exactly keeping distance and if someone is having a 10-person gathering? Are there different levels to the enforcement and, and what 
the consequences are. So, Danielle, the enforcement is being headed by Conrad Bates, and what we're looking at is the there's a um, level of risk from low to high. And when we're looking at um, enforcement, part of that is warning, part of that is education, and then there's repeat offenses, and then there's serious offenses. So. If someone had a co someone was diagnosed with COVID-19 and is having a party at their place, that would be um, different than if someone encroached or six feet distance out outside. Or it's it really depends on the risk to the public. And there's two ways of um, enforcement. One is complaint generated. One is um, proactive. And so levels that are low risk will be still met with warning education, whereas um, violations that put the public at high risk will be met with more severe repercussions. Such as? So for there's ticketable offenses, there's imprisonment. Um, we can give you more information later because there are regulations, so I can provide that to you later, I just don't have all that information here. With the public health order, it's um, for an individual, it's, it's a fine of up to 10,000 or six months of imprisonment for a corporation, it's 50,000. But for the um, mass gatherings, there's uh, a gradient of regulation. So you're not gonna be hit with $10,000 for a minor dis misdemeanor, it will be education. But I can provide you more the legal language on that later. Wonderful, thank you so much. And I just have a quick follow-up. This is for Minister Knockleby. Um, last night we had seen you had expressed your support for the work done so far by the federal government. And I know that this was in the wake of the NWT and Nunavut Chamber Mines along with the Yukon Chamber Mines, sending a letter out to the federal government um, about that support for businesses. Um, you did say that the territorial government is committed to working with them to further highlight the unique needs and interests of the North. I was wondering if you might be able to extrapolate on that and what work the territorial government is doing or what commitments you're making right now at this point. Thank you. Um, so what I meant by that was just that one of the, the main things that we're realizing as I think anybody who's done business in the North is how much different we are from Southern Canada. Uh, when I speak uh, or I'm on my federal, provincial, territorial calls, um, the scale of difference between ourselves and say Ontario is very striking. Um, I, Ontario was talking about on the tourism call there are 50,000 hotel rooms that were cancelled for one conference. I, I said we don't even have 50,000 people in our territory. So um, the scales are quite different and um, the, the federal government can only um, work off of the best knowledge that they have and if they've not spent any amount of time or have that intimate knowledge of the Northwest Territories and any of the three territories for that matter, um, they're not going to recognize where uh, we aren't able to meet the same standards or requirements that Southern Canada can. Uh, one of the areas where this has been highlighted to me uh, would be in the reporting for the 30% and now 15% uh, revenue loss in order to qualify for the 75% wage subsidy. So this was one that was raised um, to us that you know it'd be very onerous on small businesses in the Northwest Territories to provide that as well too. Some don't actually, some businesses don't roll up their their revenues monthly. So, you know, they wouldn't know we'll be able to express their loss for three months. So these are areas where we felt that we needed to go to the federal government and, and imply or, or impart upon them uh, these differences where maybe they just weren't aware when they when they did the writing on some of these, um, these subsidies and, and grants and such that they're giving. Um, so one of those areas has been that our exploration sector does not um, they don't have revenues, so they are a, uh, an area where they, they raise money uh, and then they go out and they spend that money. So for them to demonstrate a, a drop in revenue for the month of March, they can't. So they don't, they don't qualify. So there's huge sectors of our, our business and our resource and mineral sectors that don't qualify. There's another bit of fine print about um, companies that export products that affects our minds. So this is a conversation that's just starting. Um, one that the Chamber of Mines has brought to my attention and very much wanted us to also be 
um, you know, lobbying the federal government on their behalf. Uh, currently, our efforts with the federal government have been more around the stability of the supply chain as well as uh, health care. So um, we wanted to ensure that when we came to the federal government with the ask for the mineral and resource ex uh, extraction sector, that we were doing so at the right time. Um, currently, like I said, the first priority was to, to, to ensure the safety of our supply chain and then the health care, as Minister Tom would, would speak more to. So um, now that that's underway and we feel that, they're, that we've been heard, um, I was very loud at many federal tables, I can tell you that, about our airline industry. So uh, now that we've, we've moved through that, we're, we're focusing on our next stages, which is economic uh, relief and recovery, which will take longer than the immediate health and safety of the people of the territory. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Question, Danielle. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Batiste at Radio Tega. No, okay. Francis at CKLB, are you still on the line? Morning, everyone. Oh. A little, okay, we'll do Batiste first. I think there's a little delay today, so we'll go for De Batiste first, and then Francis will head over to you. Sounds good. Thank you, Crystal. Um, just for the benefits of uh, French-speaking listeners right now, uh, could uh, Dr. Kendall uh, please uh, just pouvez-vous simplement expliquer uh, quel est le, quels sont les, or les ordonnances qui ont été émises aujourd'hui, résumer simplement l'information en français? Ça serait très gentil. Merci. Okay. Je vais, je vais essayer. Um, il y a deux ordonnances. Il y a une ordonnance. Um, um, L'ordonnance dit qu'on ne peut pas avoir um, personne plus, de, plus que 10 personnes à l'extérieur. Um, dans notre maison, um, c'est seulement les personnes qui s'habitent dans la maison pas aucune, vis aucune euh, personne peut euh, visiter la maison, c'est seulement la personne qui s'habite dans la maison qui peut rester là. Mais dehors, on euh, encourage des personnes moins de 10, 10 mois euh, peut aller à l'extérieur, mais faut il faut qu'il euh, y ait 6, 2 euh, mètres entre les personnes. Pour le camp, um, c'est plus, um, plus pour les personnes qui travaillent dans le camp. On a de, de ordonnances pour le, le secteur minéral et le secteur d'énergie qui dit qu'il faut que le, on a de intervention sur le que pour que le, le travailleur maintienne deux mètres entre eux et aussi. Um, il faut comme mettre en faire une température ou la symptôme de COVID-19. Um, 14 jours avant, uh, voyager à la, la point de travail et avant aller sur l'avion. Et quand la personne um, entre le camp, surtout le, le, il faut que um, chaque jour, on, um, le, le travailleur um, fait le le signe de euh, COVID-19. S'il est des signes de COVID-19, il faut qu'il euh, reste dans la chambre et appelle le médic et faire isoler la, la patiente euh, dans un autre quartier de la, la site. Est-ce que ça se fait? Je m'excuse me, je si je... je C'est la deux ordonnances, ça, je pense que euh, si vous avez des questions, tu peux me demander maintenant. Mais, Je pense que ça... Merci beaucoup. Okay. Merci beaucoup, c'est très apprécié. Can I have a follow-up now? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, okay. Uh, in English this time, um, I mean, Canadians are very used to their freedom of movements. Uh, the right of assembly is a constitutional right in Canada. I bet there are people listening right now that are thinking that maybe their basic rights are being encroached upon. Uh, could Minister T uh, Tom perhaps uh, respond to the concerns of people that might have uh, regarding the, the respect of their basic civil rights. Thank you. Yep, thank you. 
You know, this pandemic is very serious. In the last four weeks, the last three, four weeks, our department and the, the government of the Northwest Territories have been responding quickly, and that's okay. It's okay to respond quickly. We've been putting measures in place, and I think this is the best thing that we, the only thing at this point that we have to do is to be up front and start taking measures and like I said, my op opening statements, we are ahead of any other province or territory in the country. So, you know, my advice is we need to start taking this seriously. So thank you. Thank you. Um, we're gonna go back to some of our questions from viewers. We have a lot of concerned um, individuals talking about things about childcare. Um, so they're, they're wondering, you know, caregivers coming into their home, are they gonna no longer be able to have these individuals come in, whether that's grandparents or other people while they're at work? So I don't know, uh, Dr. Candola, if you can address that concern. There's exemptions, there are exemptions for that um, category. One of the, um, the, um, in the order, we have specific exemptions, so we allow essential services and essential workers and businesses to continue. If we do look at um, the um, how in Canada the COVID-19 is being transmitted, 30% is related to travel, 70% is um, community-driven, but within the community, um, only 1% of um, contacts um, have stated that school or childcare, daycare were the source of the contacts. And when you look at work, only 2%. The, the, the sectors that are higher risk are healthcare sectors and a person's own home. So um, we are not exempting um, people who provide an essential childcare service for you so that you can continue and provide functioning for NWT, so carry on. Thank you. I want to also remind the uh, media and people watching from home too that following this press conference, we'll be sure to issue, uh, post the news release on our website as well as the two backgrounders and the actual order will be posted on there as well. So people will have an opportunity to go and look through that information if they need some more clarification. Um, and now I'm going to quickly give Francis CKLB your question and follow up. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, to to turn a little bit towards the uh, remote worksite order, Dr. Candola, how is this order being monitored at these remote sites? So the WSCC have um, specific staff that have been working with the remote camps. They, we've looked at their protocols um, we've already reviewed um, um, the photos. Um, they, we've, we've been able to work with the oil and gas and with the mine sites in reviewing what they put in place uh, before people get there, um, things they put in place now, and um, the compliance of these protocols will be monitored through um, workers' comp. And if there's any um, infraction or lack of compliance, that would come to our office to investigate. The other thing we have to realize is that um, these companies have posted their, all the things that they've done to keep their work site safe. It's been posted um, on their website. And if you look at some of the measures that they have done, I would venture to say that I would find it safer being on an oil and gas campsite and a mine campsite and being in the general community in terms of the rigor, the cleaning, the social distancing, the minimizing to essential workers, the daily um, screening check, the check before you go in, the check before you even get there. When you look at all the risk reduction strategies that these companies have put in, it, it, it is probably safer to be on that site than in your own home. Minister Knockleby, would you like to add to that? Sure, um, very much. I think Dr. Candola, again, has done a really good job of, of summarizing it. Um, if you've ever done any work at a mine site, I think you'll know that they're probably some of the strictest and most stringent from a health and safety standard um, of any of the work sites in the Northwest Territories. And I know that firsthand. Uh, we used to always complain, actually, <laughs> going into some of the mine sites about 
how rigorous it was. So I have never had any doubt that the mine sites themselves are, are enforcing this and are really on top of making sure that their, their employees buy into it. Um, of course, there's always individuals who are not going to follow, follow protocols and procedures, and those are going to be the ones that you're probably going to hear about uh, over social media or through word of mouth. Um, again, that brings me back to, I know we've started an enforcement group, however, really the ultimate way we're going to fight COVID is through social responsibility. So really it's on all of us to ensure that we are following Dr. Candola's orders and uh, the health and social services orders, um, as well as the enforcement um, officials. Uh, really, I think it has come to a point where we can only hold people's hands for so long and people need to start taking responsibility for themselves for their friends, for their family. And if you do see people that are acting in a manner that's not safe and not following these orders, then call them on it. I've, I'm a firm believer in public shaming. And I think we need to start getting to that point where if people are not following the orders, you tell them. I'm um, Have legislation, they have um, to regulate work sites and they have specific regulations around mines. If there is an issue of compliance, they would investigate um, if it's an issue that involves us, we would be a co-partner to help enforce. But there, there are already pre-existing regulations to ensure compliance. And we will, like I said, we would um, be an extra resource and we'd be supporting that these, these um, orders are maintained by the companies. Okay, thank you. I'm going to turn it over to Mario at Radio Canada. Uh, yes, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm sorry if this was addressed. I missed, uh, I had audio problems for the start of this. Uh, I, I, I just keep hearing effective tomorrow. I see in the press release it says effective immediately or Friday at 12 p.m. So is it tomorrow or today? It's two, there's two orders. The, the mine order is effective as of noon today, and the public gathering order is effective as of noon tomorrow. The compliance enforcement tasks are meeting as we speak, and they'll be doing additional training tomorrow. We just needed them to be up and ready to be able to enforce over the weekend. Perfect. And are you, uh, I guess you kind of mentioned this before, but are you expecting that you'll be giving fines anytime soon? I mean, now, the, now that the working group is, is in place, um, what, what uh, yeah, I guess, are you expecting any fines? We have the ability to um, to respond to ticketable offenses. It's going to be a combination of warning, education, and um, assessing the situation to see if this is a ticketable offense. One of the um, methods right now, something that was already highlighted by another journalist, is this is um, a new order. And over the weekend, people may simply not know. So it's a matter of educating them. And then there's another scenario where people may know and are willfully defiant. So those are two different orders, two different scenarios and may require two different responses. Okay, thank Perfect. you. Thank you. Um, I know we've got a couple follow-ups here. One of the questions that I want to ask is, um, well, Ollie actually first, he wants some clarification on the mass gathering. So Ollie, if you want to go ahead and ask that question, feel free to do that now. Yeah, thanks. I just want to be absolutely certain what is going on with outdoor gatherings, because in the news release, we've got a phrase that says no get togethers with those in your ha with those not in your household, even if you're outside. But in a background of document, we've got you can still go for a walk with your friend, but you need to keep at least two meters apart the entire time. What's the deal with people from separate households outdoors? So, Ollie, this, um your uh, question will be addressed once we post the public health order that that's an order it's a legal document so in that public health order legal document in that first um, which was not a, an order we in our first um, March 22nd public health advisory mass gatherings we said all mass gatherings need to be cancelled immediately and that was a recommendation not an order when you when the actual order is posted tomorrow it will have very clear language and what we're stating in that order is um, is about for a, a private gathering, no more than 10 people outdoors, six feet apart. Okay, I, okay. I still just need to be abundantly clear on that. 
people from separate households, as long as there are 10 or fewer, can be yes. outdoors together as long as they maintain their distance. Absolutely, Perfect. absolutely. Lovely, okay, thank, thank you. you. And gonna... I'm going to squeeze in one more as well. I'm going to pull a Bob Weber on this situation. Uh, oh. What happens if we, uh, what happens about things like electricians and plumbers and things like that if you need someone to come into your house and fix something urgently? So, um, Ollie, we will definitely not let your house get flooded with a block toilet or anything like that or be powerless. They're in the order itself because it is illegal. You'll see exemptions for that exact same scenario that you talked about. And you'll, just like someone else, you'll see exemptions for essential services like caregivers for your children. I feel um, some of your concerns will be addressed. And I can tell you right now that you will be, um, you will get that plumber and electrician. It exempts them. All right. Thanks, Ollie. I'm going to turn it over to Paul Hay River Hub. Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, uh, Dr. Candola, uh, I have a question for you. Um, have any of these uh, similar um, restrictions on people being in other uh, residences? I, I haven't heard of those elsewhere in Canada. And I'm wondering why would they be necessary here when I don't believe, I could be wrong, that they're anywhere else in Canada? Okay. so. Um, Paul, that's an excellent question. So, Nunavut has um, restrictions indoor, outdoor on gatherings. Quebec has restrictions on indoor, outdoor gatherings with similar exemptions. PEI has put in restrictions, um, recommending, uh, they put in recommendations against gatherings. So, those are the ones that I know that are similar to the Northwest Territories. And then in other jurisdictions, they put restrictions. Um, with numbers from anywhere from 5 um, to 10 to 15 and 50. So that's, those are the other jurisdictions. We, what's unique about um, Nunavut and the Northwest Territories is that um, we, we, we um, are in, Nunavut doesn't have any cases. We're in the cases where our cases are travel related. We know in that own private households, uh, where we stay that um, the ability, if we um, maintain these border restrictions and self-isolate, the ability within our own household to protect ourselves is good because we know where they are, we know where they've been, and they're pretty much in our own private dwelling. Once you start mixing um, people, especially when they're going indoors, um, you, you bring that additional risk not only to them or to you, and we feel that indoor restrictions will help achieve that increased physical distancing that Dr. Tam was talking about, the Chief Public Health Officer. What we want to do is try to reach um, our peak a lot earlier so that um, what she was talking about, the modeling, is if we can achieve very good epidemic control or a really good sense of physical distancing, we may reach a peak in late spring uh, with the waning of the summer. So this addition, these additional measures that I've done indoors is an ability to allow physical distancing and a more aggressive measure so that we don't have to go be dragged on months and months with these restricted public health measures that somehow all of us, not just NWT, but all of Canada, um, increase their physical distancing measures that we can deal with this epidemic a lot sooner. Do you have a follow up there, Paul? Uh, yes, I have a follow-up. Uh, I think a lot of people would agree um, with uh, stopping indoor parties and and stupid things like that. But uh, from what I understood, you said earlier, Dr. Kendall, you're talking about the only people that are allowed in a residence are the people that live there. So nobody else is allowed to visit a friend, visit a relative. And I think somebody mentioned this earlier. Isn't that an infringement on... on and civil rights for people to not just one person to, to drop in and see a friend or even a, a sick relative or something like that? So we allowing people to um, go on their deck or go outdoors and still visit their friends. You can still visit your friends from online social connections. Um, we unless we know what your, why your friend's sick, we don't recommend people visiting sick people. That's um, it's just um, it's an additional safety measure. 
And maybe elderly person, this, maybe it would be better. Yeah, so for a public health emergency, if we're looking at the greater good of trying to prevent community spread of a pandemic, that would override these individual liberties. Wow, okay. Okay, thanks, And Paul. Uh, if I could, if I could please, uh, what uh, legal uh, um, basis are you doing that? Is that on the uh, emergency uh, um, uh, emergency measures uh, act that you've, uh, or emergency, uh, uh, I guess, emergency measures that you've imp uh, imposed? Uh, and uh, what else is in that, that you, the other steps that you could go beyond this? This, so I, on March 18th, I um, declared a state of public health emergency. And these measures, I hear you, these measures appear to be restricted. But what we, I can tell you right now is we've had five cases of travel-related COVID-19. And if these measures were not in place, if I had let go, we could, based on modeling, could have doing nothing, you could have 70% of the NWT population exposed to COVID-19 and the healthcare system overwhelmed where they would not be able to meet the health needs of the critically ill. That's doing nothing. Doing a half-hearted response um, will still drag it out. By being restricted for a short time, a short amount of time, that's the best strategy to try to reach the peak sooner. Okay, I have another clarification here. So, uh, Dr. Candle, if you can please clarify for our viewers at home about the child care. So, are we clarify, is it just essential workers who are exempt from child care or is it all in-home child care? We, we, under the Public Health Act, we exempted day homes and daycares. So, somebody coming into my home to watch a child, that's allowed? That's, 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 um, if someone's regularly coming into home and watch a child, that would be exempted. Okay, perfect. Thank you for that clarification. Uh, we have a written uh, question here from our um, reporter friend Mo at Vista, who is having some <laughs> audio troubles. Um, in terms of the order regarding businesses, can you please clarify what will go in and how it will be enforced? What are, and if we can also touch on what are the fines again for breaching the order? So I know you did touch on that, but if you could reiterate. Okay, for the businesses that are exempt or the businesses that can carry on. Um, Sorry, I'm just trying to. Hasn't specified in terms of just regarding all of the businesses. So, can you clarify and clarify the business model that's being uh, that's identified in the order, and then identify for us how it will be enforced, and will there be fines for breaching the order? So, the there are businesses that um, when we did again going back to that March 22nd order, which was a public health advisory, it was an order, it was a recommendation, and we had um, canceled mass gatherings, and we put a list of businesses that would need to close immediately because they couldn't, um, their business like personal service establishments or where you can't maintain that um, six feet of, or two meters of physical distancing, or, and there's some aspects of business like dining where um, the worker can't bring your food and not violate that six feet or two meter. So in the initial public health advisory, those businesses were um, listed and they had already closed. And so what we're doing when moving this into an order is we now, it's an enforceable order. And other than one or two investigations, um, if there are violations, we would enforce it. We'd, we can get in touch and protect the WT, or it could be through our toll-free line. We would enforce it, but most of that enforcement already happened. These businesses have closed, so we don't see an impact with the order on anything different because this has already been take, taken place like two weeks ago, two, three weeks ago. Okay, perfect. All right, final question here, another clarification, just lots of, uh, of course, this is a subject that viewers at home are really um, interested in, so a lot of them on here. Um, it's, this is, an, so yeah, like I said, another clarification, and if we can explain what exact, what familial, or like family arrangements will be respected, so child custody, those types of things are being asked. So the child custody, we recognize that that came up, and that there will be specific um, exemptions for those so people who are in that arrangement, 
they um, those two households would be considered the household of that child. They can still um, respect the child custody arrangements. Just have to connect with um, the Protect NWT email, and and we can um, address that on um, specifically. But they're they're exempt, so the, the child is not forced to pick one household over the other. They can still go to both households. Okay, perfect. Thank you for that clarification. I'm going to turn it now over to Minister Tom for some remarks. Thank you. In closing, I just want to thank Dr. Kendola and her team for all the hard work in putting these orders together. Uh, I believe we have clear guidelines in place uh, so that Northerners know what part they have to play in stopping the spread of this COVID-19. We, we are in this for the long haul. I think today's order struck a necessary balance between keeping industry and business operating while keeping Northerners safe as possible. Be safe this weekend. Remember, stand strong, stay apart. Thank you. Thank you, Minister Tom. So again, for those of you asking, we'll be posting all of this information on our website. We'll share it on the Cabinet Communications Facebook page and, of course, the Twitter pages. Uh, be sure to always check the Health and Social Services website for the most up-to-date information. And for media, if you have any follow-up questions, please do not hesitate to email press secretary at gov.nt.ca, and we'll get back to you as soon as possible. So thank you again, everybody, and enjoy your long weekend. Thank you. Thank you.